Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, dear colleagues, dear friends. It is my great pleasure to welcome to all today. My name is Irina Pinchuk, uh, and I am a director of Institute of Psychiatry of Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev. I am country director, International Technology Transfer Center, Ukraine, and head of ISAP Ukraine National Chapter. ISAP Ukraine is pleased to invite you to attend the third and final webinar in a series of webinar of mental health of use and substance use. ISAP Ukraine in this series of three webinars would like to raise issue around youth mental health and uh, bring acknowledgement that is connected with substance use. We invite three world-known speakers to talk about depression, self-harm, suicide behavior and uh, comorbidity of mental health and substance use disorders in youth. We had more than 1,000 registered from different countries for this third and final webinar. This is a great honor for us, as well as a huge responsibility. This third webinar will specifically focus on youth substance use, trans considerations and evidence-based approaches. I would like to inform the attendees of the webinar that you can send us your questions in the chat during the presentation. Uh, please find the chat in the go to webinar control panel. So, it is my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Sherry Larkins. Dr. Larkins has worked for the University of California, Los Angeles, integrated substance abuse programs since 1998. She has led various international and domestic evaluation, training and capacity building projects over the last two decades. Uh, prior to these activities, she oversaw epidemiological and clinical research uh, studies investigating uh, the spread of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections among substance users with a focus on treatment intervention for higher risk population. She has been involved in substance abuse research uh, for over 20 years and uh, completed her doctorate in medical uh, sociology at Rutgers University in 1999. Uh, her research interests include stimulant abuse, adolescent substance use, treatment for uh, mangenalized population, sexual risk behaviors associated with substance use, and qualitative methodologies. Dr. Larkins, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Pinchuk. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, again, my name is Sherry Larkins, and I'm from the University of California, Los Angeles. And uh, I am going to be talking today about youth substance use. And um, so uh, good, good early morning if you're in my time coast, uh, west coast of California. Uh, and good afternoon and evening for many others. So what are we gonna to cover today? So we're gonna be talking about youth substance use. And it's always good to, to think of who are youth because there's lots of different uh, ideas and definitions, but we're gonna be talking about some of the more unique definitions or features of youth versus adults and why focusing on youth substance use is important and why their, their needs and their unique characteristics are important to address. We'll talk a little bit about this idea of risk versus diagnosis. Uh, youth and adolescents and young adults and transition age youth, all of this category of, of, uh, of a population are really one that's very much at risk, but a much smaller percent actually meet diagnosable criteria for a substance use disorder. And we'll kind of talk about interventions for each and how that looks different. 
And then we're going to get in a little bit to sort of evidence-based approaches with youth, including a lot of risk reduction and harm reduction, sometimes what we call early intervention, as well as some of the unique case management needs that are specific to youth. Uh, in many cases, this includes inclusion of family that looks different than it does for adults. And then finally, we'll end a little bit on just talking a little bit about sort of real co-occurring disorders. Uh, uh, clients or patients or youth who, who have both a diagnosable substance use disorder and a mental health uh, disorder. So developmentally, who are we talking about here? Uh, we, we often have lots of names for things. Uh, adolescents, we might say teens. Sometimes we say minors. Uh, sometimes we use the more broad term that I'm using today, which is youth. Uh, sometimes we hear the word young adults. And even the word transition age youth is kind of common in mental health practices in the United States. And so who are we really talking about? A lot of this depends on uh, your perspective, the field that you're working within when you're addressing youth. But it really is whether it's a 12 to 17 year old, a 12 to 15 year old, a 16 to 21 year old, a 12 to 24 year old. The, the big hallmark is that it's this developmental period that's characterized as a transitional phase of really growing or maturing. A lot of, a lot of, uh, of growth and maturation uh, emotionally um, in all sorts of developmental ways that make them unique. And who are young adults in Tay in specific? We, we use this term tr young adult or transi transition age youth is often that kind of later uh, kind of like that, the, the later um, adolescent period where we're really talking about 16 to 25, kind of that adolescent, adolescent to young adulthood period. And really a lot of transitions, including neurobiological, hormonal, physical, emotional, cognitive, and social. And uh, why do we sometimes focus on this later group? The later group is um, this sort of older, slightly older teen, if you will, group, is they often age out of the teenage or adolescent services. They're no longer kind of fitting into those child and, and teen services, but they're really not developmentally prepared for adult roles and services yet. So, and we also find that the risk between age 16 up to age 24 or 25 is really a heightened risk. And we'll see that in a minute when we look at some demographic trends. So what are some characteristics of this time period? Well, developmentally, a lot of times people are starting to plan for or completing some of their educational goals, whether that's kind of high school or some college. Uh, this is all sort of happening during this, this time period. People are moving toward more independent living. So we're starting to see some independence from family or for, from friends, uh, and maybe that includes independence in terms of their living situations, they might be starting to get some financial independence. So we see you know, some changes in terms of their, their social structure and their social dynamics at home. It, now is when relationships start to happen. So more uh, romantic relationships, sexual relationships. And uh, in some cases, people are starting a family at this time. So it's that kind of... Uh, transition into adulthood that can be uh, uh, marked with all, all sorts of potential risk. So how is it growing? What are some of the epidemiological trends of youth? Well, since uh, we're drawing from uh, many, many countries this morning, um, we're not going into specifics of different trends of countries, but just sort of very generally, there are some things that are unique to youth culture. And uh, that includes, um, oftentimes initiation or increased use of cannabis or marijuana. We, we start to see um, initiation or increased use of things like e-cigarettes, hookahs, blunts, um, more access to prescription medications, which means there's potential for prescription misuse. Uh, we see more social engagement, so use of club drugs. Club drugs become available, so MDMA, methamphetamine, uh, lots of things that you might see uh, during clubs or parties. And uh, a, a, a certainly a worrisome trend uh, that we see is use of opiates and heroin and uh, 
we're seeing globally some changes in use of fentanyl and increases in fentanyl in the heroin supply, which is also very concerning uh, because of its uh, uh, such a high risk for, for overdose. So where do we start? Where do we start with all this? Well, when we think about youth and we're really talking about what, what is it that we're trying to prevent here? When, when we, we know that youth in general are kind of in a, in a risky uh, period in their life. We call this a substance use risk uh, category. So are we focusing on, on preventing substance use disorders and, and more addictive use, uh, uh, sort of increased use of substances? Are we really focusing on trying to prevent problematic use or even misuse? Um, and or are we really trying to prevent exposure and really minimizing the access that you have to even being exposed to any of these substances? So we like to think about where, where is it that we're focusing our energies? And a lot of that depends on the age developmentally where the, the youth are at, as well as sort of a variety of other sort of risk situations that are occurring in their lives. So, what we want to recognize is that youth are just as a whole characterized as an at-risk at population for developing substance use disorders because they're really at that initiation phase where things can escalate. So we think that there's, you know, it's developmentally a characteristic of youth. There's emotional maturation, identity formation, life skills development, and risk taking as a part of that. And during this kind of age range, we often think from the youth perspective, we sometimes call this the five S's. And for, for the youth, there's increased use of social media, um, speeding in your car, meaning independence, more independence and freedom from family members and from parents, um, sexual activity, also spending. So there's a lot more financial independence here. Um, the ability to earn money and the ability to spend money and make decisions how they spend money. And, and of course, substance use experimentation is often a, a key during this time period that people begin to experiment, whether it's with drugs, alcohol, or tobacco. From the caregiver's or parent's point of view, somebody like me who has, you know, a few children, we have a different focus. Our focus on the five S's is really about safety for these youth and, and adolescents. And we want them to make good decisions. We want them to have meaning and purpose in their life, maybe some sort of spiritual grounding. We want success for our, our kids and our family members and our youth and our adolescents. Um, we we want to help them save and learn how to spend money appropriately. And we want mostly security for them. So we see that there's, you know, there, this is a, a period of, of tension developmentally between what youth and young adults need and want and what caregivers and providers want. And of course, substance use experimentation is, is often a big part of this. So when we look at the kind of risk patterns and, you know, substance use for youth is really made up of a series of, of different risk patterns. So we start here with experimental, which is inclusive of many people. Many people try something once or twice, um, have tried things a, a few times or tried a few different things. And what they realize is that it's, it's something that they're not particularly interested in, or maybe they're interested in only in very limited contexts. They have a lot of uh, controls around when they're interested or how they're interested in using substances, whether that's drugs, alcohol, or, or tobacco products. Then you move to some who are more purposive. And by purposive, it really, we mean there's a purpose here to the youth, uh, the use. Um, there's a goal. There's a goal to change how I feel, to change my mood, to change how I think, to change how I'm feeling about myself, to change my relationship with my friends. Um, and so, now we're moving into a, a, a smaller group. And then you see that we move to more intensive and then ultimately more severe. And so part of our goal is to talk about these risk patterns and what youth need at various levels of risk and how we can support them in kind of a more of an early intervention when they need it or a more intensive intervention if their use has elevated. So we think of substance use disorders as being what we call developmental disorders. And, and that's why I kind of changed 
I talked about the different age ranges in here that are inclusive of, of when we talk about minors or teens or young adults or transition age youth. And research shows that the onset of substance use disorders starts during this developmental period. Uh, it peaks during the year spanning from 18 to 24. So we can look and see whether it's marijuana use or any illicit drug use, um, alcohol use, binge alcohol use, and tobacco use. We see commonly this trajectory of, of uh, people who report using in the last month in these age ranges that it goes up and it usually peaks somewhere between kind of 19 to 21, 22 and starts to decline throughout the life course. And so a lot of times when we talk about um, where we should focus our energies into addressing risk patterns, as well as the population that looks like they're becoming uh, uh, more uh, in purposive in their use, or, or perhaps more intensive in their use, or perhaps even developing a substance use disorder, we, we see that almost 90% of adults who are over the age of 25 who have a substance use disorder, they started using under the age of 18. Okay, so 90% of adults with a substance use disorder started using under the age of 18, and half of those were using under the age of 15. So we do know that, that if we can delay and, uh, and kind of prevent and delay some of these risk patterns from taking hold, we, we uh, provide some benefit to our youth and young adults. So a quick reflection on the uh, etiology of substance use disorders. What do people, you know, why do people use drugs? And, uh, and what do youth in specific say? So when we think about what youth are saying, why they're interested, the first response, generally lots of responses, but the, the big response is they like to feel good. We all like to feel good. They report that there's, they are curious, it made them feel good, they had fun. In some cases, they were bored and it took them out of their boredom. They had family members, maybe brothers or cousins, relatives that were using, and they saw that it was fun with them. Some people report that they see it in their neighborhoods and their streets. It seems very common. It seems like a lot of people use. Some people, they're introduced during their first romantic or sexual relationship with a partner or boyfriend or a girlfriend. Some people, it's within their friend group. Their friends are talking about it. They talk about uh, some of the good times they have when they're using. And for others, they report seeing it in the social media and ads, radio, TV, and film. So there's a large group of people that, and youth that report, I, I started using because it makes me feel good. And then there's also a, a pretty sizable group that report, I use because it makes me feel better. And those are the folks that are, are really more um, kind of in potentially in that co-occurring disorders category, at least pretty early on, where they're really self-medicating. They're using, maybe not to feel good, but just they just don't want to feel bad. Using makes them worry less. It makes them less anxious. It makes them less depressed, at least temporarily. They're, they feel hopeless, but when, they, when they're using something, they feel less hopeless. They feel a little better about themselves. And so we like to think of those folks as, as also a, a target of, of some of our efforts because they're, they're folks that are probably, you know, have an untreated mental illness or mental health issue, which if properly treated may sort of lessen their interest, desire, or need for a substance that helps change them. So something important to remember in all of this is that youth and Tay are developmentally different from adults. They have different patterns of use and really they have different needs. We think of them, they're not many adults. Uh, most of, in the United States and uh, some of your countries may be similar. For many years, for decades in fact, our treatment of substance use disorders as well as our kind of early intervention sort of approaches for youth looked like they did for adults, exactly the same. 
we kind of made the assumption that youth uh, are no different than small adults and we kind of addressed their needs as such. And within the last decade, um, we've gotten lots of really great research, a variety of studies, including one at UC San Diego, uh, the ABCD study um, and others that really have showed the um, sort of the behavioral, um, some of the cultural, the uh, developmental, the environmental differences uh, in youth that warrant um, different services for them and warrant different uh, uh, intensiveness in terms of the type of work that we do with them. Because this transition period into adulthood, as I mentioned, is filled with socio-emotional processes for youth. And there's lots of people, in, even in the absence of substance use, this is a time when, when lots of mental health issues start to emerge from our you know, early, early adolescence um, and teenage years all the way through our early 20s is when we start to see uh, often red flags for different mental health issues. And it's also at the same time when we are developmentally seeing people experiment with substance, which is why it's sometimes hard to disentangle these two and uh, get a sort of differential, what we call a differential diagnosis. We see some people with mental health, some people with substance use, and, and a lot of the people that are in both of these categories have both a mental health and substance use. And so out of those, you know, those uh, young adults and, and transition youth who report having a mental illness, only about 42%, so slightly less than uh, uh, half um, are uh, getting treated. So about half of those with the mental health go untreated. But if we look at those who use substances during this developmental time period, we see that it's almost 90%. Only 87% have untreated substance use issues. So one of the things we know is that we are not doing a very good job addressing youth mental health. And we're also, and we're also doing a far worse job addressing um, youth substance use. And so if we look at some of the, the kind of brain imaging, it's, it's kind of helpful to see, to start by looking at what is it, why does the uh, developmentally do we look different during this sort of early uh, uh, adulthood time period? And we, we have lots of brain imaging that shows that there's this sort of reduction in gray matter from age five to 20. And most of that is due to unused synapses. So we see that pruning effect. So um, neural pathways that get used a lot that get reinforced, get strengthened and built up, and things that are less used, we, we prune them. They, they kind of shed. And uh, we, we no longer need them, so to speak. But it's important that as this neural development is happening, um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's kind of a tender process anyway in the absence of substances. And then when we layer on kind of uh, mind-altering substances that kind of can affect those neural pathways, um, we have lots of sort of potential for risk. So if you look, here's an immature developing brain system influencing risk taking. So you can see our, our youth right here has, uh, looks like lots of youth with uh, mostly emotion, sex, sleep. Um, and uh, there's a little tiny bit in the front that says common sense right above his eye and uh, smart mouth and uh, snark. Uh, so, uh, mostly focused on uh, things other than common sense at this age. And when we look at how brain maturation occurs, we know it occurs from the back to the front. Um, and uh, we know that pruning is happening during this time and the neural pathways that are used a lot where there's, where there's rewards, where there's memory formed, um, that those neural pathways are strengthened. And so early on we see motor sensation, um, emotions and motivation, all sort of um, developing first or developing or strengthened first. And later comes this sort of common sense or what we sometimes refer to as, you know, uh, good, good decision making or, or good judgment. And so we, we see this, this sort of disconnect here. If you look at functional development and you look at the prefrontal cortex system here and you look at the limbic reward system, so the limbic reward system is um, its motivation, its emotional processing, it, even memory 
uh, things that are rewarding and reinforced get for, kind of formed into sort of strengthened memories and, and uh, desire to do something again. And when we see sort of developmentally how these processes occur, the prefrontal cortex is much slower. It goes at a really kind of steady but slower developmental pace. And you see the limbic reward system, it, it goes faster, quicker, and it gets heightened. And it's not until about sort of age 23, 24, 25, 26 that we see that the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex system are kind of working uh, more maturely and in sync. So you see this, what we call a maturation gap and this imbalance between what's cognitive and effective development. And this is kind of where, why risk taking happens. You see the prefrontal cortex, we have the thinker sitting there going, hmm, I'm gonna make a good decision. And then you have the limbic system that says, just do it. Um, you know, it's kind of like your gas in a car, the just do it, the limbic system is your gas. And the prefrontal cortex system is your brakes. And so again, this imbalance between your gas and brakes. And sometimes during this time period, we, we get youth with a lot more gas. And so what happens is there's lots of exploration, there's curiosity, there's new experiences. Socially, there's fitting in. People are experiencing boredom. Maybe there's emotional interests and uh, you know issues with coping. So these are kind of some of the factors that are behind this risk taking. And when we look at sort of areas in the brain where this happens, we often say, you know, here's some focus like on inhibitory control, maybe some poor self-control. We say, why do you make irrational decisions and why are you so impulsive? Again, a maturation gap in how quickly or slowly these areas of the brain develop. Why are you so emotional and less practical? So sort of mood regulation. And even the robust reward center, the, the reward center, the limbic reward center where memory and reward are, are, are forming is why do you seek fun and take risks, pleasure, motivation seeking? And just to sort of sneak peek when we get to interventions, we'll realize that most of the interventions for youth and even some with adults focus on these areas. So inhibitory control, motivation and drive, learning and memory and emotions and reward and reinforcer. And so, you know, good youth interventions, they address all of these areas. Inhibitory control, a lot of behavioral skills focus. You'll see some of the evidence-based interventions that are focusing on youth really focus on these behavioral skills to try to teach youth to sort of uh, to identify and, and uh, be able to uh, change behavior. And motivation and drive, you see motivational interviewing, motivational enhancement therapy, areas where we're trying to sort of enhance motivation and focus motivation in, in a different way. You'll see some interventions that focus on coping skills to address some of these kind of emotional liability sort of up and down and emotional processing. And some of the learning and memory you'll see, this is why cognitive behavioral interventions are, are often a, an initial sort of go-to. And a, a lot of youth uh, interventions uh, with more science behind them, look at some of this idea of reward and reinforcement. This is contingency management, um, not always the most um, widely used, but often one of the most, um, uh, has a lot of solid science behind its use, is use of uh, balancing out the rewards, the natural rewards that occur. How can we provide external reinforcers or rewards uh, that, that kind of balance some of this out? So some of our targeted interventions for uh, our youth that develop substance use disorders specifically try to address each of these sort of what we would call developmental gaps or, or deficits. So how, how do youth uh, look different from adults? And some too in research, we look at ambivalence around youth have more ambivalence around identifying and addressing substance use. And also their risk perceptions are different. So if we look at some of the ambivalence, you know, there's this, I don't have a drug problem or I got into trouble, but I'm not that bad. And why do I have to go to treatment for months or even twice a week? This idea that there's a lot of ambivalence because they have not 
had the time to necessarily develop a, a severe substance use disorder. Um, so oftentimes the commitment to change is different. And it's something that we have to address when we work with youth is that very often they're very ambivalent about this, um, this messaging that happens in, in adult programs that this is a lifelong chronic medical condition. And which is why their perceptions are that, you know, they don't, they're not sure that they buy into the disease, the illness or disease model. Um, younger folks will, their perception of chronicity or recovery, it looks different than it does for adults. Um, they think that maybe that it's a behavior that they can um, change. They have personal control over it. Uh, they might just need a little support. Their beliefs or their feelings are that it's a behavior that can be stopped. It's not a pattern that has been set in motion for too long. Um, and that they also, they value um, kind of the social groups and contexts in which um, maybe substance use takes place. So this really affects their desire or their motivation to stop using or their need for help or their interest in getting support for this. So not only the way we engage and we outreach to youth has to look different, um, but also um, the way that we sort of retain them in services, the way the messaging that we use that for them necessarily has to look different because they don't have the same perceptions of their, uh, their issues as a disorder, as a lifelong problem, as a chronic medical condition in the same way that adults may. So how are we, uh, how are we gonna address this? So, we have an opportunity. We know that investing in youth services can promote short-term and long-term well-being of youth and their communities. And we have a pretty good sense of what works. We've done lots of research on kind of more tailored and targeted interventions for different levels of risk. But the real issue is who gets them and who has access and how do we outreach and help folks identify risk, their own risk and desire or interest in making change. I showed you a statistic earlier that 87% of, of youth and young adults with substance use issues who could benefit from some type of intervention, they go untreated or they go unaddressed. And so we have an opportunity here. We, we, we have a pretty good idea of what works or at least what could be helpful, but we need to sort of match it to those who need it. In our current paradigms, we spend a lot of time on prevention, you know, drug skills, social norms, trying to keep those people who maybe have just experimented not elevate. <clears throat> but and and on some end, we have you know residential programs or treatment or outpatient treatment that's more focused on abstinence. But right there in the middle is where a lot of youth and uh, and where a lot of risk reduction can take place where we can prevent people from moving into a need for treatment. Uh, we can address by doing early interventions and risk reduction. Uh, for those who have moved from experimental to maybe purposive or purposive to more intensive, that there's something that we can do to reduce risk and help them recognize uh, a, an interest and a desire maybe to change behavior. So it's one of the reasons why screening is really important because youth, although many of you that are on today are working with youth who are, do have a substance use disorder, a diagnosable substance use disorder, do have a co-occurring disorder, maybe have a mental health and substance use disorder, but that is not the larger group of youth. That is a smaller sliver of youth. Typically youth are not that sick yet. They haven't developed a substance use disorder, but we have the opportunity to capture them in this risky category. So it's one of the reasons why screening and sc screening in a lot of different settings, including schools, doctor's offices, uh, a range of settings is very important because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of screening tools that can help us identify whether our client is no, has no risk or very low risk, or whether they're moderately risky or whether they're high risk to later develop a substance use disorder. And when we intervene early and address things early, we have the opportunity to, to, to change course. So 
a mild or low substance use disorder, many youth will decrease or discontinue substance use either by maturing out of it or by experiencing a personal or significant life event. Um, Maybe, maybe they've had somebody that's intervened with them or helped address some situations. Maybe they've addressed their mental health issue. For those who are in a moderate category, um, youth are early users at increased risk and a need for risk reduction intervention. So this is where um, you know, a risk reduction intervention can be helpful. And this is where messaging is important because youth who are told they have a real problem when really they fall into more of a moderate level they start to really question uh, you know, whether the adults around them know what they're talking about. And those with a, a, a more severe, what we would say is high risk, a more severe issue, um, the youth in this category, they tend to be older. So kind of on that transition age youth, that 16, 18, all the way up to 24. And they also tend to have more comorbidities. So other types of issues as well that really need intervention, emotional, cognitive, and other behavioral issues, uh, a, a, a range of other issues that really, really demands more intensive, not only treatment and therapy, but also case management. So again, this important for routine screening, the National Institute on Drug Abuse really puts this as a best practice to help. And, and the more we screen and the more universal this becomes, really we're destigmatizing uh, substance use, and it allows us to increase engagement. So we really should be thinking of substance use risks uh, as being very normalized, just other like other things that we screen adolescents for, whether it's their temperature, their body mass index, blood pressure, other vitals. We should be screening for substance use and other types of risk along with those. There's a couple of, of key tools that uh, can be helpful. Um, this is the, the BSTAD is one of them. Another one is the S2BI. Uh, these are, you know, built on screeners from NIAAA or the American Academy of Pediatrics. They're, they're, the goal is for them to be kind of quick um, and to be able to be used in a variety of different settings and appropriate and valid for use with all kind of age range of teens early and late. And the, the S2BI really kind of, it, it puts youth into buckets, essentially. A bucket of not a problem, maybe a yellow bucket is, eh, you know, it's someone who has used occasionally or used a few times and they might need a couple reminders about potential risk, but they might need a little support. But when we get into sort of monthly, what we consider more regular use, monthly, weekly, daily use of any substance, now we're starting to get into um, a pattern and a pattern that, that may benefit from addressing. And so we see um, risk reduction approaches, what we call early intervention, harm reduction, that kind of can help folks that are in this low or really moderate to high risk category. And um, so those are very easy screeners and they're all publicly available. And teaching, training, coaching, and mentoring various people, everyone from law enforcement to high school teachers or middle school teachers to parents to be able to kind of effectively ask these questions and approach the subject in a non-stigmatizing manner. Because our real goal for that group is really to um, motivate them, help raise awareness of risk, and risk identification and really sort of target through some motivational enhancement strategies, some risk reduction, giving some personalized feedback, helping with some decisional balance. What we really think about is kind of engagement and outreach around use of, and use of motivational interviewing to kind of um, support uh, small behavior changes before use becomes so patterned uh, and so problematic that they need more intensive services. Now, when we get to um, uh, youth who need more intensive services, there, there are, there are um, tips and resources that are out there. And recall those brain development areas that I tipped you off to before. We know that uh, a lot of them focus on um, behaviorally based, their motivational enhancement, 
Some include reinforcers and rewards as well as CBT strategies, and those kind of accommodate that youth brain, some of those deficits or maturation gaps that we identified before that uh, look a little different from adult brains. And then there's some additions of family-based interventions. And, and uh, as I'll show you in a minute, inclusion of family is really one of the most important Inclusion of family as well as reduction of family conflict tend to be some of the best predictors of, of uh, long-term positive outcome for a youth who does enroll in substance use treatment. And so there is some, you know, there are resources that are focusing on substance use treatment and family therapy and in multidimensional family therapy for adolescents and youth. The, uh, the role of family is, is key if we can get them engaged. And then of course, pharmacotherapies uh, when warranted. So here we have these kind of motivation skills and support, and you'll see evidence-based interventions that kind of focus on these, uh, that focus on the self-regulation, the self-management, MET, MI, CBT, and family support, and all of the particular areas that they uh, are um, uh, addressing it within the content respecting autonomy of the youth um, and the sort of their stage of change and how resistant or engaged they are, um, a, the goal of invoking intrinsic desire to change, tapping into some of those cognitive areas, the impulse control, um, supporting problem solving and, uh, and coping and self-management, and then finally addressing the communication, conflict resolution and, and family relationships. So what do we know that sort of to kind of start a bit of a summary, what do we know that youth services should look like? Well, we know that youth need outreach. Uh, going back to that statistic I shared earlier where almost 90% of youth who, who could benefit from some type of intervention are not getting it. They're going unserved or untreated. So what, what do we do about that? It means outreaching in places that serve you. That might be schools, health centers, churches, recreational centers, or other social service, service areas, or working with other types of social service providers. We also need to shift strategies. Due to COVID, it may be reaching out to families. We need to start becoming more electronically present um, because outreach is important. And being able to educate youth about availability of services in their communities to try to reduce stigma. And again, it's not services doesn't necessarily mean treatment. Sometimes these risk reduction services or these brief interventions, not more intensive interventions that people are worried about or think, I don't really have a problem or I'm not that severe. I don't have a chronic medical condition. So we need to be in places where youth are. And we need to make our services more engaging. So this, uh, the idea of making services appealing, words like prevention and education, they're not very enticing to you. So we need to tailor our messages differently to them and really begin this informal outreach to begin building rapport and enhancing motivation early. Um, there are many people that are considered risk, risky, at maybe a moderate level of risk or a, a low or moderate level of risk that could really benefit from engagement and we're missing them. And those are people who may move on to higher risk or more uh, substance dependence. And what should youth services look like? You know, we need to create spaces that are fun and appealing to youth. Uh, use of incentives, we mentioned kind of contingency management and rewards, but Promoting participation and engagement. Mm. Tapping into that reward center in the brain that, uh, that uh, we talked about sort of earlier when we looked at a developing brain. Tapping into that reward center. Making transportation and even field-based services. Telehealth. Uh, we know COVID has changed the landscape entirely for how we reach certain, uh, clients, patients, and in this case, youth, and how we provide services to them and help finding uh, community-based support. So there might be some mutual help or 12-step 12, uh, 12 or uh, youth-focused groups. Very often uh, groups and community-based groups that focus on adults, they focus a lot on abstinence, they focus a lot on um, 
the chronic disease model of substance use and that doesn't always settle well with youth and so we need to find ones that are more targeted to their interests and finally very important is the care coordination and case management so um, we know that the that the case management needs for youth are uh, are are uh, can be very intensive and and what we need to support them with um, getting parents engaged we talked about um, family interventions as being reducing family conflict and um, enhancing family engagement into the therapeutic process or the intervention process is critical for youth, different than what it is for uh, adults. But we have a hard time often engaging parents. And this is culturally very different, it depends on where you are in the world. I've worked in places where, where parents will do anything for their children and they're with them the entire time and i've also uh been um in places uh like the united states where um it's really hard to get parents engaged and so there's a big range in this but for us why don't parents come and a lot of times there's a lot of barriers to commonly experience that parents and family members experience sometimes they're frustrated um, a lot of times they have their own dysfunction or their own mental health and substance use issues. There may be access issues. They have other children. They have transportation issues. And they also, there might just be a lot of cultural stigma and shame of, of their child having a substance use disorder. They might sort of disown them or leave them be, or they'll say, "This, you got yourself into this. You got to get yourself out of it. And so... Um, uh, we often, there are some interventions that focus specifically on better engagement of parents and family, because we know that that makes a big difference in the long-term outcome. And so um, when parents are involved, uh, it, it, is, it is better for everyone. And when conflict, family conflict is lower, uh, it is better for everyone. So it's getting those, those parents and the family members engaged, getting that support there. And case management is key, um, really a critical that there should be a focus on care coordination with other systems that might be mental health, it could be primary care. Our, our youth have all sorts of developmental needs, whether, whether it's immunizations or birth control or mental health issue, uh, mental health services or transportation. Um, there are a range of needs and the more that we can kind of support that whole person and that whole youth, uh, the better, and, and, and vocational. I can't um, forget vocational needs. So there is, um, there are some resources that focus on this more strength-based case management model for youth and, and um, how to promote resilience and uh, how to provide better case management and embed it well into our services. And also, uh, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't sort of highlight that there are going to be, despite a big number of our folks who are at risk, maybe at low, moderate, or high risk, that there are those who are already diagnosable, that have a, a true substance use disorder, that, uh, that, have, that they have a mental health issue, whether it's ADD, or ADHD, maybe anxiety, depression, um, a conduct disorder, and that substance use is really a critical or in, very integrated component into that. And for, uh, it's estimated that about 60 to 80% of youth that are at risk or with a substance use disorder experience a co-occurring mental health issue. So this is a big chunk of those who have a substance use disorder are also struggling with a mental health issue. And these data just look at sort of in the past year, if you look at you know, all 12 to 17 year olds who have used these substances in this chart. If you look at those who have had a major depressive episode in the past year, you'll see that those even right here with just talking about uh, depression, we see that it's, it's much, much, uh, much higher of those who have used substances that have also had a major depressive episode <clears throat> in the last year. So something we always need to be, uh, careful of, thoughtful of, and ensure that we have the, the proper services to address all of it. Um, I think this is, uh, I'm at my time. So um, I uh, wanna thank all of you and uh, appreciate everybody's interest. And I will um, turn it over to Arena for any questions. Yes. 
Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Larkins, for very interesting and, and very actual uh, presentation. Now we have some time for questions. I would like to uh, thank uh, to our participants for uh, submitting the questions. We uh, received two the same question. Um, uh, what, uh, how about with, uh, if the youth refuse to accept the prevention and accept the treatment? What okay. Do right. So um, this is going to be kind of maybe clients who are more uh, resistant or not interested. Uh, I think this is common, and I don't know if they're, they're talking about those who are moderate risk or high risk. Um, a couple of things. Many people who fall into this sort of moderate risk, which is a, a, a lot of youth, they don't identify risk yet. They haven't experienced many negative consequences for their use, and um, so they are less concerned. There are a few ways in which um, different systems of care can support them so um, and provide messaging to help them identify and maybe consider reducing risk. Um, that may be whether it's through their schools, whether it's through their primary care physician or their doctor, if, there's, if they are engaged with healthcare. Um, those might be trusted adults who have the ability to um, provide some messaging. There's also some programs that focus on peers and peer-based messaging. So other peers sharing their experiences and helping uh, identify maybe some level of risk that they would be willing to reduce or uh, address. But I do think it's one of the reasons why Outreach, engagement, and use of motivational interviewing or motivational enhancement therapy is, um, is critical is because uh, lots of people don't recognize risk and are not interested in it, even as though as professionals, we sort of recognize this. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, how ADIGD can be addressed in a adolescent who has addiction from stimulants. Okay, say, say this again. How can? Uh, how uh, ADHD uh, in adolescent can be addressed in adolescent who has addiction from stimulants? If the people have ADHD and uh, um, use right. uh, and are abusing stimulants, so it. It's possible that they have a um, maybe an untreated, it sounds like a potentially an untreated mental health issue, like maybe untreated ADHD, and are using stimulants. Um, this, this is a lot of people who, it, who find use of stimulants um, helps, um, helps with their mental health issues, particular ADD or ADHD. It does take a, a good physician, which I'm not, to really help with that differential diagnosis and, and provide treatment that addresses this, this, the stimul, uh, the ADHD. And I would say that um, there are a lot of treatments that are non-stimulant based that are available. And I do know adolescent psychiatrists who, have, who are addiction trained and treat ADD are very in tune with this about the types of treatments that they consider and will use with those who have ADD, a diagnosable mental health issue, and also potentially at risk for abusing stimulants. So I do think there's a range of options, but it, it does take um, uh, those types of clients or patients should be seeing an a, a addiction trained adolescent psychiatrist to kind of help with sort of medication management around this. Thank you. Uh, question next. Thank you for very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, what is the best approach for preventive intervention of substance use in youth? And in what age should they be given the preventive intervention? Okay, so the, it sounds like the best uh, prevention. So 
there is like more primary prevention. And I think some of the primary prevention programs start early, like elementary school and definitely by middle school. And those are very generalized. They're not targeted at all to any particular risk categories, but very sort of generalized. Most of those focus on life skills and education around, uh, and they can be done developmentally appropriately around um, providing information to um, children essentially um, about substance use disorders and um, that's kind of more primary prevention. Some of what I talked about today, and, and that happens, there are a few programs that have been shown to, to work, some of them that are less beneficial. Um, what we find is that the ones that are um, less beneficial are often kind of the scarier ones. Sometimes the, the ones that are targeting, um, you know, they have the, in the US we have like scared straight, and the DARE program. And those are often, um, the, the research behind them isn't very strong as primary prevention. So chances are we're, scaring children isn't probably the best approach to getting them as a primary prevention to, to not be interested or not engage in substance use as they age developmentally. Um, some some of the, 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 I guess, the more effective ones potentially are, are ones that engage youth around things that they like or are interested, things that are visual, things that are reinforcing, things that are kind of more rewarding, and things that might provide some education and some skill-based, um, whether it's, you know, drug refusal skills or things like this that are, prepare them. But those are all primary prevention. When we move into kind of more um, kind of targeted prevention, that's a little bit more uh, targeted to categories or, or youth that are already kind of at risk, where we've already seen some development of risk. So that there are other kind of early intervention or risk reduction strategies that are, are more of a targeted intervention. And those are often, again, we, we, we don't find that um, the kind of the scare tactics are that helpful. Um, some of the things in early intervention that can be key is something we called like personalized. So um, if you say um, to somebody that, um, if you say to somebody, for example, like uh, let's talk about like um, high blood pressure, a, di a different medical condition. If somebody has high blood pressure and we're, we're saying to them, you know, as your healthcare provider, I have some concerns because your, your, um, your blood pressure is very high and, it, and having high blood pressure places you at risk for a variety of other medical issues like a stroke or say a heart attack or something. Um, the more we can personalize that. So um, as your healthcare provider, I have some concerns with your high blood pressure. You know, it places you at risk for a variety of things. You, you reported that you have been feeling fatigued and tired or that you're not getting great sleep. And one of the things that we wanna do is help address those things that you're experiencing. So the more during an early intervention or a risk reduction strategy, the more we can take it from the general, what we know about you know, use of substances as people get older, but can we personalize it to them? Any, anything that they've been experiencing, maybe, maybe changes in friendship groups, or maybe they haven't been getting as good of grades, or they're worried about, um, they didn't get a job they, they wanted. They're worried about sort of how they're feeling. They're worried about some of their sleep. If there's anything that we can personalize to them, we see that it, it's tied to sort of a better outcome because they're more personally invested and they've experienced it. That would be kind of a more of a secondary kind of prevention. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, thank you very um, much for interesting presentation. Are the screening tools what were presented suitable for university students as well, or uh, there are other screening tools available for these groups? Uh, good question. So the screening tools um, that I, I gave a cup, I showed a couple of them. There's another one that's very, very often used called the craft. Um, some of them are used in, um, they, some of them are used internationally and they have data that they've been normed or validated for use in, in different countries. 
they they would um most of them are sort of validated up until some of them up to age 18 and some of them up, you know up through age 21 i would say that you would need to look at them something like the s2bi is uh something that is based only on use so the questions are related to how frequently, how often, what kind, what do you use? It's what, what's your route of administration? So it's use specific. Some of the other ones for youth, they, they don't ask about necessarily use. They ask about consequences. Have you ever gotten into a car with someone who's drinking or using drugs? Have you ever gotten in trouble? Have you ever uh, gotten into an accident? Have people, your friends or your parents ever told you that they wished or they wanted you to cut down? So it, it does depend on what your who your target population is and what you're interested in, in sort of getting. But we have used um, the craft. I would say the S2BI because it's use-based might be better for college students, but you can also look at the BSTAT and see, but all of them are kind of normed or validated up to age 21 typically. And in some cases, some people use both. So the craft is six questions. It's C-R-A-F-F-T, it's six questions. And then the S2BI is like, a, it's three questions kind of essentially depending. Uh, but so some people actually use both. They wanna know kind of about the risks that you've placed yourself in and, and others wanna know about the actual use. The reason why the craft doesn't touch upon too much about direct use is because of the stigmatized nature of substance use. They kind of dance around the topic instead. So saying like, has anybody else ever told you you should use less? Or has um, have you ever gotten into trouble when you've been using? And so they kind of dance around the topic where the S2BI is directly like, how much do you use? How often do you use? And is there a pattern to your use? And they, you know, so some people use both together. And, and I would say you should always look at screening tools because there are several out there to choose from. And so you'll wanna find the one that fits into your setting the best. Some are better self-administered and some of them uh, can be interviewer administered and some of them are very easily self-administered. So you'll wanna, depending on the setting where you're, where you're in, you'll wanna kind of investigate them. Thank you and uh, maybe last question. Uh, what's the best strategy for dealing with misinformation about the safety of cannabis use? Oh, yes. Um, yes, the, there's a lot of probably messaging and especially with CBD and other things that are, and the increase in access and legalization. Um, it is, it's hard to offset this misinformation because uh the there is a fair amount of research particularly now that that the amount of thc that is in these products um whether it's whether it's cannabis or whether it's edibles or a variety of different products the amount of thc that's in them is is increasing so there's there's like a, a enhanced level of purity and that is is really directly tied to some pretty severe mental health consequences so for youth that are already at risk, um, there are mental health, depression, anxiety, and even psychosis that's associated with heavy use of cannabis at an early age. So it does take a lot of messaging to help people understand that the, the uh, products that are available today, even though they're becoming more accessible, more available, and more destigmatized, essentially, they are also becoming stronger and um, and probably more dangerous for many of our youth, particularly those who are vulnerable. So it does take um, messaging that to offset what people are hearing. And some of it is that providers themselves and family members maybe also are, are, are far less concerned. So, you know, I've heard mothers say, well, you know, I was smoking pot in the 1970s, so uh, every day, and you know, I'm a, a good, uh, taxpayer now and it didn't hurt me at all so it's probably no big deal for my child not sort of being educated about that your child may have some additional mental health vulnerabilities and that the substance itself is not what you were smoking 40 years ago it's gotten much stronger and uh 
And so really trying to sort of educate youth and educators and teachers and parents about this is important so that so that they know that the product is um, is 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 potentially risky. Thank you, Sherry. But I want uh, <laughs> one question. Maybe um, this is the last because uh, I think it's very, very interesting. If someone wants to start a youth prevention program, what is a good place for them to start? What do you think? Wow. So youth prevention program, you'll want to start with lots of um, You'll want to read up on lots of resources. There are some good prevention programs out there that are that do focus on how to message this properly. Like youth are not that interested in coming to a program that is called a prevention program to help youth stay away from substance use. That's not what's going to engage them or interest them. So making sure that the messaging is is cool and young, and uh, that that the the outreach techniques. And that the activities that you provide are are engaging and focus on a variety of development from you know vocational to skill to you know mental health as well as education around substance use uh, but but a lot of sort of activities and also things that are field-based we're at least finding here that um, it's getting hard it gets hard to get youth to where we want them to be and particularly with covid we need strategies where we're able to come to them as well at times. So um, we also need to sort of change our thinking around the physical locality. This may vary from culture to culture, but we're finding that, you know, getting youth to come after school to one location and, and um, listen to prevention messages around substance use is, is nothing anybody wants to do. So, uh, you know, you have to make it fun, you have to make it engaging, you have to have food, you have to have physical activities, and you have to have uh, other resources that support them vocationally, emotionally, and everything else. And, and a lot of that is sometimes done in a field-based way. So reaching them and being thoughtful of outreach is important. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sherry. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Pinchuk. Thank you so much. And thank you to ISEP. And uh, thanks to all of you who are on today. I appreciate you guys uh, hanging in there at, in your various time zones uh, to, to talk about. Thank you. Thank you for your great thank contribution you. for this event. I also would like to thank um, you know, for particip uh, everyone uh, for participating in our webinar. I would like to thank everyone uh, for participa participation in all a series uh, our webinar. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, our technical support and uh, looking forward to meeting all you uh, soon at uh, the ISAP uh, Ukraine event next year. Thank you. I hope I'm there too. I hope to see you, Arena. Bye, everyone.